Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ryan Keating. Today we're visiting with Word Baker, the director who is responsible for I'm Getting My Act Together and The Fantastics, which is now going into its 25th year at the Sullivan Street Playhouse. Mr. Baker, welcome to Spotlight. This Thank is a you. pleasure. Thank you. Um, certainly 25 years is a long run for any show. Uh, the longest. And I'm not counting the mousetrap in London, but here. What do you attribute The Fantastics appeal to? Is there anything God you can put your finger on? I don't know. I don't know. It just it puzzles all of us, and it keeps going. And I'm I'm amazed. I don't know why. I think maybe there's something to do with the fact that I don't think you're allowed to graduate from high school anymore in this country unless you've been in or seen the Fantastics <laughs> in some production. And maybe that's why it, when people come to New York, <laughs> everybody has done it somewhere or other and seen it or knows about it. I don't know. I have no idea. Pretty songs, nice script, beautifully directed. This is something that had started uh, at well, Barnard yeah, College. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that story has been told a lot, hasn't it? I was in one act and uh, Ron Liebman and Susan Watson and people like that were in it, but the main part of the story is that Susan lost her voice on opening night, and Harvey was playing the piano, and he sang her part the first time we ever did it. Uh, How would you describe the difference between that production and what we oh, that was see such the a plan. cute, darling production, very commedia, very. Uh, in London, they called it twee. I don't know exactly what that means, <laughs> but it fits what I think it was up there. It just didn't have the guts or the meat that it has now. Uh, in combination with its, for years the New Yorker magazine said it was whether whimsy was as thick as that, and uh, I don't think it's whimsical at all. I think it's very romantic and very pretty and moving, and has something to say to everybody, not just a family show, but it's uh, it works for people. I, I'm meant to work for people. Do you think it's because of it's a variation on the boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back? Is something that everybody can relate to in that? Well, I think there's something that everybody can relate to more in never say no. If you say no to your <laughs> children, that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the universal, to me, anyway. Um, at the dress rehearsal, there was a man by the name of Laurie Noto who came in, and Harvey Schmidt had said in an interview that he was wearing a white linen suit and a little straw hat, and everybody thought he was very wealthy. Uh huh. Well, he was in my acting class, he and Jerry Ragney. And uh, one night I took the hot off the press's mimeograph uh, script of the first few pages just to hear them read and invited the class to the dress rehearsal. And so Laurie came and liked it. It was kind of exciting. I think exciting because we don't realize today that was pretty far out stuff. We were doing no, we were doing no scenery and talking to the audience and having a mute, a Chinese prop man uh, mm -hmm. run around and do all the stuff and just doing it with four poles and a board in effect, and bringing things out of a trunk. Uh, I don't know. It was very avant, very startling at the time, but we weren't doing it because of that. We just thought that's what we wanted to do, and did it. And that's what's been running. Not that production up there. We did a lot of different things downtown, and better. Tom and Harvey wrote some... There was a speech about rape, and they turned it into a song. And Round and Round was originally a thing called Have You Ever Been to China? Done all up and down and around the ladder. And uh, I have acted like a fool, turned into They Were You, They Were You, the great number at the end of the show, that love duet. Uh, because the critical reaction when the show first opened was not good, how did the momentum build? People in the theater, I think, are as responsible as anybody can say for the word of mouth. <clears throat> it was what we were doing in the theater that caught on first. I mean, the theatrical form of it, the nature of the piece, the 
boldness. We didn't realize that at the time. But it didn't it didn't fare well with the critics. Some liked part of it and some liked the other part and nobody agreed. And uh, theater people began to see it uh, or would say to their friends, go see it. And then they would, oh, Cheryl Crawford and Bobby Lance and people like that uh, were real strong behind it saying this is something new and, and interesting and fun and nice and go see it. And it played two weeks in East Hampton that summer at the John Drew Theater in just a hotbed of theater people. And when it came back to town, uh, after Labor Day, it was sold out for two years. And it was the theater people who wouldn't let it close. You had once said that your mission was to break down the proscenium. Yep. And, uh... Well, we did. The first show I did in New York was in the round. It was The Crucible, <clears throat> off-Broadway with Paul Levin. Uh, and we built a theater. In those days, you did that. You didn't have a place, so you found one, put it together, and did it in the round. And uh, God knows, a few years ago, I was doing a show in Boston, and they had a curtain, and I just loved it uh, for proscenium. And, but we did. Everybody in those days off-Broadway was breaking through the proscenium and saying the audience is there, we know it, you know, we know it, and let's uh, huh, relate that way directly. I, you see, I think we grew up feeling that you shouldn't do anything on the stage that you can do better in film. So mm -hmm. the trying to be realistic, we were also doing this right in the middle of all the after studio kitchen drama, uh, Hat Full of Rain and stuff like that, that where you were going for the reality of it. Well, I think we thought, and I, I know I did, the reality of it is that it's a theater and that there's an audience there watching us act, so let's go. And here we go. Do you find it more of a challenge to work in a in the round as opposed to a theater with a proscenium? Well, it's a fun challenge. You can't do everything in the round. And I uh, first saw theater in the round in Dallas, Marco Jones's theater. and. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful challenge, challenge, but you don't have to do anything except to play and just be there. And you don't worry about people being behind you because they're looking at the person you're talking to, and that's the way we exist. We don't uh, see everybody full front all the time. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we're used to it, too, from film and television, that kind of camera angle. And I love theater in the round, but you can't do everything in the round. Not everything works. They try it, but it doesn't. Do you find that the situation off-Broadway is easier for you artistically, where there's less pressure? Where there are fewer people, I think. The, that's the, the minute the committee begins to grow, and theater is one thing you can't really do by committee. The, the minute more people get involved, the more difficult it is. Just that simple. And uh, yeah, it's easier. And it doesn't cost as much money. Do you think you have more creative freedom? I think so, yes. I, I think you can find your vision. I think you can realize your vision easier, smaller, if you don't have a big vision. That is, if your vision isn't too big. I don't know. It seems to me that lots of things nowadays... Uh, find their place smaller and then expand a little bit. Do you find that intimacy lends itself to off-Broadway situations? Yes. Goodness knows. Uh, you had started directing with uh, Mother Goose, if I'm not mistaken. You're not mistaken. <laughs> I still have that old Mother Goose book where in my good second grade scrawl I had written the names of the people, the fellows in the neighborhood. <laughs> that I had assigned various uh, of the Mother Goose rhymes to learn, and then we did a show. And how successful was it? Well, I'm sure we got enough to buy some lollipops <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> they indulged us. We did a show every summer in the town that I grew up in, and of course it was what we had seen in the movies. Uh, oh, and people would visit their, their grandparents in the summertime who could play the piano and stuff like that. And so we did a 
summer musical every summer that we just made up out of. I remember we did "By a Waterfall" right after that mm -hmm. song was in the Busby Berkeley thing. I don't know how we did it on the grass, but we did. Uh, you had gone to the University of Texas to study acting. When did your um, major change to directing? When did that interest start? The first bunch of auditions I went to <laughs> when I saw how good all the other actors were, all the actors were. I did some acting at the university, but usually in those teeny tiny meaty little parts that come in in the second act and walk off with the second act with a short scene mm -hmm. where you can do something whammo. And I had fun doing that, but I shifted gears pretty quick. And I guess I have always directed. I don't know. You put the show together and tell everybody what to do. You have some kind of something that says, Ooh, I know how to do that. And this is what we're going to do. I did that with picnics and parties and stuff like that. I always have all my life. Kind of run the show. Mm -hmm. You were known for doing a jitterbug act as well. But yes. I had done uh, the first what, what, was, what is still done every year at North Texas State Teachers, State University now, uh, the varsity show. They did them, Mickey and Judy did them in uh, the movies, so mm -hmm. I thought we should, and I was president of the freshman class, so we did. And that summer, they were auditioning around to do this thing for interstate theaters, college capers of 42, with a couple of three people from every college around Texas. And they put it together, and they paid us the princely sum of $25 a week and furnished room and board and grand hotels and met us with com uh, convertibles at the train. We would finish, we did, I think, seven, five shows a day between movies, between a movie. <clears throat> Still can't remember that movie, but I was just one of a pair of jitterbugs and tap dance and backup singer and stuff like that. This show had showgirls. Bob Banner was the conductor of the orchestra in that college show, the famous Hollywood television producer. You had um, started to teach when you had left college. How did you find well, that experience? Brainwash you in college saying, in college drama department saying, now you better have something to fall back on. Uh, don't, it's too hard in New York, but that's partly because, well, they don't really know about New York, and, or didn't in those days. So I also had a wife and two children that I needed to have some sort of security for. Well, teaching is not any more secure than the theater, thank you very much. But I enjoy teaching and I still teach. I think a good teacher has a kind of like a preacher, a call to teach, and I still get great satisfaction and great return from giving what I know to young people. And I get back what's going on with young people. And I like that keeps me alive. How do you find students' attitudes changing over the years? My goodness, we've been all the way through the 60s and the 70s and so on. The whole Godspell group of people were students of mine at Carnegie. And we were just doing what was going on then. And I, that's how I keep up with the times, keeping up with the students. And I go back to colleges every once in a while and do a show uh, with college students because you don't know if you're retired or removed or dead, in effect. Uh, I just have to go with the wind. You would come here with your wife and two children on a summer break. And she was pregnant. I have three children. Now that's certainly a risk to take. What well, your, yes. What were your first impressions of New York? That I could lick it. <laughs> when I arrived, I had no... I did things that I wouldn't anymore think of doing today. Just pick up the phone and say, I've got this thing. And Tom and Harvey and I had a show called Portfolio that ended up being most of the stuff in the Julius Monk early reviews. And I just pick up the phone and say, I've got something I want to show you and tell you about, too. Carmen Capalbo and people who were big in those days, and I didn't know that you didn't do that. And so I did it. I uh, shudder to think how brash I was in those days, and unafraid, undaunted. But it was a grand summer. 
there was a Charlie Baker who was uh, very influential, excuse me, influential in opening a, opening a lot of doors for you. Well, he, uh, his name, and I was going by Charlie Baker in those days because I had said, I didn't even know about this other Charlie Baker. Uh, he was the biggest agent of William Morris at the time. And I called Joe Melviner. I heard there was a job opening. Joe Melviner, the scene designer, said, this is Charlie Baker. And he said, well, come up. Uh, and I went in and uh, was ushered into his office while David Merrick had to wait because he thought I found out I went to work for Joe and he didn't tell me until nearly two years later that when I called and made the appointment he thought I was the other Charlie Baker uh, and he said you have to change your name can't do that well I didn't for a year or two and finally there was a thing in Variety saying that Charlie Baker William Morris didn't get double commission, so he didn't cast anybody in Happy Hunting, and I was listed as the casting director. It was a show that Joe was producing. And I walked into the office that morning, and Joe and Herman Bernstein showed me the story in writing and said, Now, see, we've been telling you, you have to change your name right now. And I said, Okay, what? Joe said, Well, what are your family names? And I said, My mother's last name is Word. He said, That's it. So I wrote a letter to Variety and to Charlie Baker saying, you got here first. Thank you very much. Uh, but henceforth, I'll be Word Baker. Mm-hmm. On the 10th anniversary of the Fantastics, I got a telegram from Charlie saying, I'm changing my name to Word. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very nice man. And we laugh. We have laughed often about that whole... I know young people now who say they have this name, and that's theirs, and they're going to keep it. And I say, Paul, but you're silly. But somebody else got here first. Uh, you had said that um, you believe in working with real actors and allowing them to make the decisions for what themselves. What do you suppose I meant to? by that? <laughs> real actors. You mean live actors, huh? Ah. Uh, oh, I don't know what I meant by that. Uh, well, I think it stems from warm not body. exactly telling an actor what to do, but oh. allowing them to find it. Oh, I hope I do that. Uh, you're you're shutting off your chances of great contribution to the whole thing if you tell somebody what to do and how to do it. I've long since gave up figuring it all out ahead of time. Uh, actors con- make a contribution to the thing, and that's what you want to get. There's somebody, a mind and a talent, and hopefully they can act it better than I can. So I, who am I to say how you're supposed to do it? I don't do that. When you're casting a show, what do you look for in an actor? Talent. To light up the room. The, and it all is so vibrational. It has to do with hunch. You never know for sure. You just have that sense, that feeling. Well, I have a feeling, too, with actors. That's somebody I can get along with the way I work, that is very necessary. I also think I'm a pretty good judge of talent and can pick somebody and say, yeah, come here. Um, My track record is pretty good on talent, talented people. Mm -hmm. You've had a long association with Gretchen Cryer, who's probably one of the first ladies of American playwrights. And how did that association begin? Well, uh, I did the first, I don't know, we don't have time for the whole story, but I did a dinner theater show in Boston, and there were two people in the chorus of, the, of Guys and Dolls, and Gretchen and David Cryer. Uh, one thing led to another, and uh, at some point in the early second or third year of the Fantastics, David Cryer was playing El Gallo, and uh, Nancy Ford was playing the piano. Right. And then, either in this order or reverse, <clears throat> a fellow named Keith Charles was playing El Gallo, and Nancy was, and they met, and he's from the University of Texas. Uh, so, their very first show that they had written for here, Now is the Time for All Good Men, they took, took to Lori Noto. And he said, well, you ought to take this to Word Baker. 
And they did, and the rest is history. I've directed every one of their shows. And there's something about working with people over and over and over that is very good for the theater. A lot of people do that, and I do that. Gretchen and I don't have to talk about script very much anymore. We have the same sense of humor, and I get it, and she knows I get it, and so there we're off and running. And Nancy is just a dream with I just understand what they're trying to do. And when we were sort of talking, sort of, we were talking to Joe Papp about how to, what, he said, what would you do with, I'm getting my act together. And I said, well, I'd do what they wrote, what they want. And I got the job. <laughs> how did you find that experience? Because certainly that was not well received by the critics, but it ran for a long time. We have a real leapfrog experience with the critics. They didn't like Now's the Time for All Good Men, either. They thought The Last Sweet Days of Isaac was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. And it ran two or three years. Uh, what? What did you ask me? I'm off on another... <laughs> somewhere. I lost well, track of my own. Well, without getting my act together, it was... Oh, it was well, no, it seen. wasn't. But Joe Papp, you see, kept it running. He believed in the show. And, and you have a hard time throwing him off the track with something. Besides which, accidentally, we were, in a sh we were supposed to be there for 12 weeks in the Ansbacher Theater, and something else was due then after. It was canceled. Then something else, so we ran another 12 weeks. Something else was going to come in, and it fell apart, and so we stayed. And by that time, we'd caught on. Word of mouth has always been the thing that helps the shows that I do, I think. Or it's that wonderful thing where you see something and you tell your friends to go see it or you take them to see it. And that's the kind of theater I like the best. And I can say, Ooh, I want everybody I know to see this show. Whether I did it or not, has nothing, that has nothing to do with it. I just think word of mouth is the best. It's the only real thing about theater uh, success. It's not hype. I don't say you should go see this show because I'm getting anything out of it. I just think it's a good show and you'll like it. That's Do you find that's why Off-Broadway has flourished so much in the last few years because it's not all glitter and sparkle? It's something that's generally very intimate and very real? It can be as glittery and sparkly as anything else. Uh, I don't think that's it. I think what it is is it's accessible and you go and it's there's a little effort involved and you don't go because you're on an expense account you go because you want to or you've read about it or you've heard about it you've been told about it and you can believe that it's good when somebody tells you it is uh, you see off broadway got as expensive and as out of sight as Broadway, and what we have now is off off Broadway, which is the same thing that off Broadway used mm -hmm. to be. One of the turning points in off Broadway was when uh, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams gave us the rights to do the Crucible and Norman Twain Garden District, and that put some stamp of approval, legitimacy, on off Broadway that it had not had before, except for. Uh, Carmen Capalbo's and Lucille Lortel's Three Penny Opera. Right. <clears throat> but one thing followed the other and all at the same time. And I think they should, uh, and Brooks Atkinson, of course, went downtown to see something and wrote about it in the Times. And still, there there's some kind of uh, snobbery that I don't understand. There's been this altercation just recently about whether or not something qualified for a Tony because it had 499 seat houses and you have to have 500. Mm -hmm. Well, that's bunk. Uh, what does the number of seats have to do with how good the piece is? And the Tony, people don't even think about giving a prize to something that's run 24 years. Well, I just think, I don't think that makes any sense at all. Even they give Oscars to short subjects or something. They don't... Uh, it's, it's very strange. I, 
doesn't make any difference in London. Maybe it makes a difference here. You have to do it in London first when you bring it here. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Uh, uh, you had recently directed The Road to Hollywood, which is a spoof of the Bob Hope Bing Crosby films. Do you find that you enjoy directing musicals more or there's more of a collaborative effort? Not necessarily. No, I'm really better directing serious plays. Dr. Faustus and the Pinter plays and uh, The Crucible and stuff like that. Not better. But uh, musicals come my way and maybe it's that you bring a little bit more of the real stuff in to the musical. I don't know. I don't know. I know. I like I don't get offered very many straight plays. Since the Fantastics, have you seen any certain evolution in American musical theater? A whole lot, yeah. Oh, the free form breaking the proscenium has, uh, that's, that's part of it now, an accepted part of it. That's just something you have to write a book about. And I haven't written that book yet should. Uh, the shape of the musical has been a lot freer ever since. Uh, however, I'm getting to the point that I think people are being very free and breaking rules, they think, when they don't know the rules. Mm -hmm. And it's about time that some of those people were told now, if they enter up center, that's better. Or uh, <laughs> don't light a cigarette on his line, because we'll look at the cigarette. And the simple basics. You, you can't have fun and be outrageously creative unless you know that you're doing that or have done it afterwards. At the same time, just working on a show with a fellow wonderful musical called Cowboy that we're going to do, uh, a fellow played and a girl sang a song yesterday from it and I said I haven't heard that song and he said yes you have uh, when Why, when did you write that he said I wrote it right after you said okay the men have been singing for ten minutes it's time for a lady's voice <laughs> simple basic mm -hmm. pragmatic nothing to do with oh the creative thing is that she should sing here no I'm tired of hearing the men sing well, Word, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Is up. Thank you for allowing us to right. interview you. This is Spotlight, and I'm Ryan Keating, and we've been chatting with Word Baker. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Spotlight airs on Manhattan Cable's Channel D Tuesday evenings at 8.30, and again Saturday mornings at 11.30 on Channel C. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating.